Is this me monetizing my medical trauma? Well, perhaps, but how else am I meant to actually be able to pay for all of the appointments that I still need to have, no matter how much they suck? Um, if Barbie can have any career, why can't I do this? Isn't this like just using capitalism against itself? So snaps in the chat please. Let's be real though, in order to actually be able to pay for my medical bills, this video would need to have millions and millions of views, um, so don't forget to like and subscribe and don't forget to comment, but wait until the end because I'll know. A huge thank you to the 520 people who actually took the time to participate in the survey for this video as well. I was quite overwhelmed and um, well, do we have some horror stories to tell? Except for the fact that this isn't like fairy tales or anything, this is actually real life. And um, I don't want to make light of that situation at all, but I will be injecting levity into this video because I feel like we all need it, especially when dealing with things which are this level of grim, dehumanizing and invasive. And I did also state that this is an intersectional lens because I didn't just want AFAB people to participate in the survey, I want this to be open to trans and non-binary folk because I feel like there are all sorts of like people that get completely overlooked and um, we'll be talking about that in this video so um buckle up buttercup we're in for a rough ride. And I also wanted to highlight right at the start that medical misogyny is faced even from infancy as ageism combines with misogyny um, because so many of you are actually saying like how hard it was to get believed when you were children or teenagers um, and <laughs> been there, fully understand it. There's just no winning, it's like ageism, you win again. The goal of this video is not to demonize doctors, nurses, and people in the medical field at all. The goal is to unpack people's issues with medical misogyny, which I would actually argue is a systemic issue. I raise all the time about how overworked and underpaid nurses in particular are. I support strikes, I support fair wages, and healthy business practices. So it's not like all medical professionals are like this, it's still important to recognize that the education and training given to people, along with the work environment has impacts which are really far-reaching and I think gets overlooked quite often. Even during the training and education process, this is where sexism definitely does rear its ugly head and a lot of um, issues have come up from it. So there was actually this qualitative study from England uh, ranging from experiences with patients essaying them with no action taken all the way up to their superiors doing so. There are also still assumptions made that if anyone's a woman, then you're a nurse, for example. And it's actually impacting people in the field to the point where women straight up just don't want to be there. And the thing is, who can they even turn to? Say for example they're doing a residency at a hospital or they're getting education at a hospital, what happens if something happens there? They don't even know who they can report things to if an issue happens because, well, do they go to the university they're training at or do they actually go to the hospital? And because people are in such positions of power, it's very hard to be able to be believed. Let's just say that. And when you actually think about it, just one doctor has hundreds if not thousands of patients that they directly impact over the course of their entire career. So say for example they become an official doctor at the age of like 28, 30 or something and they keep on working until they're 70. That's quite a bit of time to be able to do some damage if you were like not keeping up with the times, not continuing learning, not actually being respectful to patients and um, I think from the survey results we're kind of seeing those sorts of issues be you know, cropping up. And there were also people from the medical field who responded to the survey themselves and gave me a little peek behind the curtain, so thank you very much for that. Um, so even though I'm including skits in this, uh, which sort of reflect my own uh, situation as well as situations that you were bringing up, um, because wow, look at us, uh, you know, trauma bonding here, isn't it? Isn't it a fun exercise? Um, that doesn't mean that I'm saying all, okay? I really want to just re-emphasize that because I think that there is a lot of room for change and growth and positivity here. And that's also what we're going to be focusing on, as you know, at the end of these videos, even though things can get quite grim, um, we always want to make sure that we know our way forward. And there are useful practical tips that you can actually implement yourself for your own medical appointments too. <sighs> Welcome! So, you're dealing with some pain. But it also says right here that you also have anxiety. So what I think that you should do, my love, is um, you should just make some lifestyle changes and how about, mm, I'm just, yeah, I'll just clickety clack over here and I'll just get you some uh, nice pills to help you deal with that anxiety, yeah? Okay, cool, so um, yeah, that'll be $50 and um, yeah, that's just for the appointment, the pills are extra. And um, yeah, 
if you could please go because I've got other patients. <laughs> Wait, but I already came in here with a whole list of issues which I've been documenting for months now. Um, I already eat healthy, I exercise every day, I drink water, I don't drink coffee, no caffeine at all, and I don't drink alcohol. Um, <laughs> And actually, what even are the side effects of these pills that you want to give me? Oh, there's no side effects that I care to tell you about. Um, you'll get over them anyway. Um, well, it must be hormonal then. I would explain why you're so fat. Um, could you be pregnant? Are you pregnant? No, and I don't want kids as I've told you for many years now. Now, I just want to get back to this list. Okay, well, I'm just going to prescribe you some other pills to help you deal with these mood swings you're quite clearly having. But I'm not having mood swings. Try these out for three months and I'll see you after that, okay? Okay, bye bye now. God, don't deal with again. The struggle to be taken seriously because we are all hysterical, emotional bobcats, apparently. By now, I think that we all know about hysteria, right? It was an alleged mental health condition that explained away any behavior or symptoms that made men uncomfortable. Its roots are in ancient Greece because, you know, of our terrible, mischievous, wandering wombs. And then in the 18th century, as um, a lot of bad things got picked up then, um, sadly, it became quite a popular thing. Now, whilst all genders could get it, women were more prone to it because of our lazy and irritable nature. It's a really strange thing to call someone that when they apparently belong in the kitchen and that's where the knives are. But the whole thing about our uterus being like the whole cause of all of our problems um, is something that is still not actually faded away. Most medical studies are actually conducted on men. Even when it comes to animal testing for human drugs, they're mostly males. Even though um, <laughs> Our anatomy is very different from the animals which are used, um, but that is a very separate issue. <laughs> Studies have been conducted about women, but only use male subjects. Maya Dusenberry has included these in her book, Doing Harm, the truth about how bad medicine and lazy science leave women dismissed, misdiagnosed, and sick. In 1993, the FDA and the NIH mandated the inclusion of women in clinical trials. The excuses to try and exclude women, as a number of you also raised, is because of our fluctuations hormones and the risk of pregnancy getting in the way of results. Shouldn't the studies account for this? Like, if you want to be able to actually cater to, I don't know, half the population of the planet, um, maybe you should um, include all genders in this and actually take into account those extra factors if you're so worried about them. Um, I'm just saying, otherwise it's not exactly representative to just use like cis white men as like a base. From my survey, this is how the demographics broke down and it does skew quite a bit younger with 11.2% being 13 to 18, 40.4% being 19 to 25, 24.2% being 26 to 30, 18.8% being 31 to 40, 4% being 41 to 50, and 1.2% being 51 to 60. So the answers given will be missing some things, like there weren't very many people who had given birth, for example, there were not um, any people that had explicitly gone through a lot of stuff to do with menopause, and how older people are actually treated in the medical system. I do bring up ageism very often in my work as well, and I think that this would be a separate topic if we do want to unpack like the horrors of menopause. Location-wise, I base this on where most of my subscribers are from. 51.9% are from the USA, 7.7% .7 from Canada, 9% from the UK, 3.7% from Australia, 1.7% from here in little old Aotearoa, 6.2% from Germany, 1.5% from the Netherlands, 1.7% from Finland, and the rest of the countries had under 1% representation, as I'm showing on screen now. So it's global, but it's very much a Western view overall, with a heavy leaning on the dystopia that is the healthcare of the USA. I asked, have you struggled to have doctors believe that there's something wrong with you that's not just written off as hormones, or being a girl or woman? or being overweight or underweight, whatever those terms are, because I call them brush off terms, honestly. 21% said yes all the time, 29.5% said yes often, 37.1% said sort of, struggle with some doctors but others have taken me seriously, 7.6% said not really, takes a bit more work to get them to take me seriously though, and 4.9% said no, never. Next I asked, have you been able to get a diagnosis and adequate treatment for your illness, injury or issue? Z. 
because that people can have multiple issues. 7.3% said yes, they ran tests and have been supportive with treatment from the first appointment. 41% said yes, needed to visit repeatedly and advocate for myself but was able to get diagnosed and have treatment. 31.9% said sort of, ran tests but couldn't find anything quote conclusive even though I'm still sick and struggling, so there's no treatment available without diagnosis. 15.6% said no, ran a simple test or two and they found nothing despite repeat visits and issues. They brushed me off. And 4.2% said no, doctors refuse to run tests or provide treatment. I kind of figured that people would have to go to multiple doctors to be able to be taken seriously, as having dealt with that myself, but I was really hoping this would skew a bit more positive. When it comes to health issues, you know that whole wandering womb thing we were talking about before yeah people still get brushed aside as having anxiety caused by the fact that they have a uterus oh my god um so that means that people just get completely undiagnosed for ages and they have to keep on going back there were so many stories that you were sharing with me of repeat visits of just not being taken seriously and this actually causing like huge long-term health impacts women with chronic pain in particular get ignored even though our health issues present as pain there's an assumption throughout history that it's much more likely to have an emotional or psychological cause rather than a physical one i have said it before and i'll say it again people can have multiple things wrong with them you can have anxiety and also a severe health condition. Maybe we're anxious because we're not being taken seriously by the people who are meant to be providing us medical care. Maybe that's making us feel anxious and constantly doubt ourselves because people just keep on getting medically gaslit. This excerpt from the book Pain and Prejudice fantastic name, by Gabrielle Jackson sums things up really well. These policies and practices have often been framed as paternalistic, designed to protect women against the harmful effects of medical research, but history belies this notion. The practice of brutal experimentation of medical treatments on women throughout history make medicine's unwillingness to include women in scientific studies seem a lot less like magnanimous paternalism. Rather, we are left with the impression that women are not interesting enough for scientific endeavour, but good enough for practice. Whew, sorry for the wait, I rushed on in as soon as someone told me that someone was dealing with chest pain and... Uh... Oh, you're um... <laughs> you didn't tell me that they weren't white. Yes, it matters. <laughs> okay, well, Mrs. Um, Smith, I, I don't care if I'm saying that wrong. Um, yeah, so it's quite clear that you're here to sort out this habit that you've got going on. Um, yeah, oh, oh, you say your chest really hurts, huh? Oh, oh, oh. Well, um, you're not gonna get any extra of those hugs that you're after here, okay? So you should just head on home and you should also be ashamed of yourself. Most of the time I just want to staple things to her head. What experimentation of medical treatments, you ask? <laughs> well, maybe you didn't, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Uh, this is where race absolutely comes heavily into play. Now, you may not have heard of the name James Marion Sims, but he's the quote, father of gynecology. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going there, sorry. Um, his research was conducted on enslaved black women without anesthesia with the belief that black people didn't feel pain. This sadly is the notion that some people in the medical field still believe <laughs> exists today. And to top it all off, this absolute POS in my opinion, um, he was the president of the American Medical Association. Owners of slaves would actually take them to him or get them to visit them um, so that he could patch them up so then they could actually be, what's the word again? Um, useful again. Um, and he was the one who invented the speculum and I'm sure that me even saying that word has made anyone with a uterus actually just like retract a bit, like recoil. Um, ah, jump scare, it's on the screen now. Uh, yeah, this horrific torture device in my books, um, he was the one that invented it. <laughs> Forced sterilization has been an issue globally, but I really want to focus in on Canada at the moment because this is still something that is actually very, very recent. The forced sterilization of indigenous women in many provinces of Canada, which took place from the 1930s onwards, not 1830s, 
1930s onwards. Even though these laws are no longer in place, there have been reports of forced and coerced sterilization in Canadian hospitals as recently as 2019, according to Native Women's Association of Canada. And according to this Senate report, there was a climate of racism and paternalism leading to the view that sterilization was for some women's own good. These attitudes and beliefs continue to underpin health policy today and contribute to the practice of coerced and forced sterilization. One of you actually raised the name of Joyce Eshaquan. A hospital staff assumed that she was an opioid addict, however, she was actually dying of a rare heart condition. The coroner even stated that racism played a huge part in her passing. This was in 2020, by the way, it's not even that long ago, and the only reason that we even know anything about it was because she was live streaming her treatment at the hospital, with these staff absolutely berating her and treating her terribly, telling her that she should be ashamed of herself, all sorts. I will link the news stories for you down below. The thing that really bothers me is if she wasn't filming, this wouldn't have even appeared as a blip on anybody's radar. This wouldn't have launched any inquiries or anything. And you want to know about the consequences of this? Two staff members were dismissed, so... Yeah, they've, they've really they've really done a lot, haven't they? Um, full systemic change there, huh? Then we add in trans healthcare, which has been attacked on all sides, like in particular in the USA and in the UK. Like, it's been really devastating seeing what's actually happening there. There are so many examples that we could cover here, but it's an issue that you raise so often too from your own experience with doctors and hospitals. The Center for American Progress, or CAP, a liberal think tank, their report found that nearly half of transgender people and 68% of transgender people of color reported having experienced mistreatment at the hands of medical providers, including refusal of care and verbal or physical abuse. And this was in the year before the survey, which took place in June of 2020. People get dead named, they get refused care because they don't identify by their legal name, and just plain turned away. And from the experiences that you shared, it's almost like medical professionals have weaponized ignorance. Like, I don't know about that, oh that's not something, oh I'm just gonna blame everything on the fact that you're on HRT. Um, and it's like, there was just such a lack of willingness in the fact that you as patients were constantly having to educate doctors. That's a very worrying thing to me. And if you're non-binary, there's a whole host of other issues as well. So say for example, someone transitions, but they've got a uterus. Because of the way that medical forms are set up, there's no way to actually like identify as male, but also having like a uterus. Like there's, there's nothing to actually be able to do that. So then you're gonna miss out on things like pap smears, on cervical screening, on all sorts of stuff, which is actually fundamental to your health. What I'm saying here is that the medical systems overall have a very long way to go. And all of the negative experiences combined mean that trans and non-binary people actually try to opt out of actually going to the doctor and getting care, which is incredibly worrying. Like we've gotten to that point where the medical system is so intimidating and not helpful, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase, that people are just plain avoiding care and that's not right. Add in fat phobia as well, something which many of you raised again in the survey. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, um, I will have this video by someone who's actually linked for you down below, so then you're actually able to get like way more information than what I could include in here. People being constantly brushed off saying, oh, you just need to lose weight and then you'll feel fine. And it's like, well, actually there's something else which is going on completely unrelated to the weight, so. Also, I'm just going to say again, BMI is BS. What I'm pointing out in this section is the intersectionality issues here because things are so multi-layered if you are anything other than a cis white man, unfortunately. And every single other thing that you are, just <laughs> framing it from their perspective here, um, that means that you are just more and more difficult, harder and harder to treat, and they just don't understand. So they'll just be like, well, it's just, it's just whatever. And your concerns get completely dismissed. And this is something which came up time and again, and it just made me really, really angry. Once again, I'm not saying that all doctors are like this because some of you have found amazing doctors that have taken fantastic care of you. And I'm so happy to hear that. What I'm pointing out is the systemic issues here. Oh, it's uh, you again. Oh, great. So, um, says that you've come here because of period pain. Again, huh? It's been, it's been quite a few years you've been coming to us about these issues. What is it? Uh, so we've got vomiting, we've got blacking out, unable to walk, unable to work, um, migraines, um, severe pain. Hmm, okay. Well, okay. 
look here sweetheart so around half the world population deals with periods or has during their life okay um and uh if they can all get along with it, why can't you? I think that you're just overreacting here. Like, it can't be that bad. Look, I'm a woman, okay? And it only lasts for three days for me and it doesn't even hurt at all. So, um, yeah, I really think that you're over-exaggerating here, dearie. Um, and also, ooh, look at that. <laughs> you're due for a pap smear, okay? So wonderful, wonderful. Let me just get my torture device. It's sorry, <laughs> not to, um, medical equipment ready and um oh you don't mind if we just bring in some medical students as well come on in boys who are these people <sighs> it's okay you're just gonna feel a little pinch and then all of your dignity leave at the exact same time just the pinch <laughs> Just a pinch is a phrase which is used so many times across the whole survey. Um, I really think that medical professionals equate just a little pinch to being stabbed with an ice pick. Um, something which I would actually equate to being quite different things. Having a uterus means being put in painful and dehumanizing medical situations. At least from my experience. And also, lots of you share the same experience. Oh, great. This isn't what I hoped for. This was not all of you though. Some of you were praising your amazing gynecologist and I'm like, I am so happy that you found them because that is not the experience of a lot of people. So hold on to them and also recommend them. <laughs> In response to this question, some people were actually saying that they straight up avoid going to the gynecologist because they are so scared from what people have said about going there and how painful it is. This is where we've actually gotten to when it comes to medical misogyny, that people are avoiding getting kind of like care that they need. Um, that's what I mean when I say like this is actually really dangerous. Reading through your responses, there were countless horror stories dealing with doctors and gynecologists causing pain, ignoring your pain, expecting you to push through the pain, bringing students in without your full informed consent, and saying that you're over exaggerating. It is so critically important that people feel safe in a medical setting to be able to actually get the medical help that they need. Like. I don't really think that I'm saying anything revolutionary by stating that, right? Because of medical gaslighting and doctors actually not listening to people when they're actually bringing up concerns to do with their reproductive organs, it means that diagnosis can take so many years, in particular for people with PCOS or endometriosis, like there were quite a number of you that suffer from endo and I'm so sorry if you do because that's horrific. I've only dealt with cysts bursting myself and that was bad enough. I really do feel for people because it takes so much money, so much time, so much effort and you just feel like you're coming up against a brick wall constantly and the whole thing is that you're having to advocate for yourself for something that you know is wrong with you and then doctors just say everyone gets periods it's fine it's not even an issue oh you're in pain well tough luck. I want to share this one line the nurse asked me if I was pregnant and when I said no she laughed at me and said I looked like it I was anorexic and had a tumour on my ovary. This is exactly what I mean. <laughs> this is horrific. Same as the treatment of people who aren't straight. Say for example you're lesbian or bi or if you're asexual or if you're trans or if you're non-binary. There's this constant shaming and judgement when you're just trying to look after your health and it was infuriating to read through what you've experienced. One person's experience involved them having to give birth at home because healthcare only recognises quote women. Then they got incredibly ill afterwards and were actually taken to hospital. After 14 days in the ICU I hemorrhaged and had to get emergency surgery. The surgeon permanently damaged my bladder to quote save my uterus which as a trans person I've been fighting to have removed for years. I had another option tell me that only mentally ill people with bipolar disorder experience period pain. When I say that some people in the medical profession see us enter the door and just look at a walking uterus that's like crying and flailing around or something this is kind of what I mean because that's all they see us as, just like this incubator that is like a feral bobcat apparently. Obstetric violence is yet another horrific thing. Now not many people have actually given birth that replied to the survey but this is still something which I think is very worth talking about. As soon as conception happens everything revolves around this tiny little clump of cells regardless of like whatever point it's at and it's like growth to actually become a baby. Now, one of you also mentioned the husband stitch, which I didn't know about, and if you don't, um, I'm so sorry, but 
we're all gonna learn today. We're learning a lot of terrible stuff. It's an extra stitch given during the repair process after a vaginal birth, supposedly to tighten the vagina for increased pleasure of a male sexual partner. I've linked an article down below which actually shares multiple people's experience with having this done. And um, again, this is absolutely just objectification of women because it's just reducing them to an object. So you're either an incubator or you're a sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> what is it's it's kind of like this is still true i've got to say and you know what when it comes to the husband stitch it's something that people don't even realize has happened at the time because it's something that people get when they've just given birth so your body is ripped it's gone through trauma and sometimes maybe your partner gets asked about it um or it, just the assumption is made from the doctor oh we're gonna make sure that they're extra tight and mm, well, these people that get the husband stitch done without their knowledge, they only find out down the track when they're in excruciating pain and they've taken themselves to the gynecologist and then the gynecologist asks, um, what happened? Like, who, who did this to you? Getting the husband stitch done can actually cause huge problems for people health-wise and it's something that should absolutely be abolished in my opinion. Like, now that I've heard of it and now I know about it, I'm just like, why does this even exist? I don't know if you also follow Samantha Ravindal, but she has been through quite um, a tumultuous time when it comes to her pregnancies and I'll actually link a couple of her videos for you down below because she's opened up this dialogue quite a bit so if you've dealt with um, mistreatment when it comes to um, birth or something I'll go check those out if you haven't yet. It's a lot and I really do feel for every single person that's given birth. I genuinely do. <sighs> Hi, yes, it's me again, your favorite person. So I want to know, once again, my permanent options for contraception. So whether that is something to do with my ovaries being removed or the tubes being tied or like hysterectomy, I just want to know what permanent options I have because um, I've been dealing with incredible pain for ages and I've told you for 15 years, I don't want to have children. Yeah, you're of childbearing age, and from when I say so, until like your mid 40s. Um, so yeah, we don't want to do anything that could like impede that in any way because you know what women are like. We're always changing our minds, aren't we? Yes, sweetie, yes we are. Wait, but you did my boyfriend's vasectomy after two weeks. <sighs> yes, but men don't get those hormonal biological urges like what women do, silly. <laughs> Well, that's an incorrect generalization. <laughs> well, it's selfish of you to not want to have children. What a waste of a woman's body. It's the greatest gift a woman can give to the world. Well, okay, fine. The best I can do is, um, hmm, birth control for you. Yeah, so it says here, oh, the three different kinds of the pill that we've had you on before, they're giving you bad side effects. Oh, oh, what were they? Oh. Oh, you weren't able to work. Oh, you were vomiting every day. Oh, hmm. okay, fine. So let's have a look at the IUD instead, right? Um, okay, so what happens with that and how much is that gonna cost me? So most of these appointments you've been there are due to this pain and blackouts and all this other stuff that you've been dealing with, apparently. So um, we'll just call this dysmenorrhea and um, just book a double appointment and we'll just do it right here, okay? Wait, but I've had friends of mine who haven't had kids who get sent to the hospital and get put under general anaesthetic and then they're still in pain for days afterwards. <laughs> No, that's not necessary. We only send people to hospital if they're real crybabies and they can't deal with like a little pinch of pain because it really isn't much at all. It's just a little bit uncomfortable. It's okay. Do I at least get a local anesthesia or something? <laughs> no need. It's a bit uncomfortable, but like you don't need pain medication for it. This sounds like getting a tooth removed without any pain relief. <sighs> no, women have had this procedure done this way for many years now. Why would we change it? Well, people also used to remove teeth without anesthesia back in medieval times, but that doesn't mean it set a precedent for today now, did it? Birth control? More like we control you. You're just a walking baby factory. When it comes to longer term birth control options, um, you kind of get offered three, right? So you've got the hormonal pill, which I've been on three versions of that have all made me incredibly sick in various ways. Um, or you have the implant, which goes in your arm. It goes around about here. Or you've got the IUD, which goes into your uterus. Um, and the most common version of this is the Mirena. I've personally had four Mirena in my lifetime. Um, I have dealt with incredible pain since I was 11 years old. And I've been on birth control of various sorts for that pain since I was 17. 
14. But my first Mirena was defective. It made me bleed every single day and cause immense pain. Uh, and that was for six months that I dealt with that. And I kept on going back to the doctor. Bear it in mind, you have to keep on paying to go back to the doctor for this. The only time that they would take me seriously is when I could actually no longer work. Um, and then I got to have it swapped out. Two of my Mirenas, I had them done surgically. So that means under general anesthesia because they were also doing other exploratory um, camera stuff at the same time for that. I've mentioned to you that I've been struggling with long COVID issues and my vision went as I was actually walking down the stairs and I smashed my tailbone like to the point where the nurse thought I had a concussion because like I was so out of it. Turns out it's just my long COVID issues flaring up. I'm still in pain from my tailbone by the way. I have to keep on stopping filming because I it, it hurts right now. I'm in constant pain but hey as women we often are. But the day after I actually took that fall down the stairs I had to get my next Mirena uh, removed and replaced. This was the first time getting it done not in hospital. I asked the doctor what pain medication I could actually get and he said none we don't give anything and I was like not even local not this not that nope we don't do any of that. So I asked the doctor I was like okay what's going to be happening and he walked me through what the process was going to be before it actually happened which was really useful and he said like the two points that we could stop at but he was also like oh but we don't really want to stop because otherwise we'll waste a device and they have to go to hospital like really actively discouraging um, getting it done through the hospital um, even though that's what I've always had done because the only reason I get the Mirena is because I deal with extreme pain and issues. My whole mentality when it comes to most things in life is just get through it like that's that's literally the focus that I've had and I think that a lot of women can actually fall into this sort of mentality too because you're like well I've been through worse pain so I, I have to deal with this now when I say this was an incredibly painful experience also because they had to use extra tools on me um I've had cysts burst and when that happened I woke up from the amount of pain and I genuinely thought that I was unaliving and I got rushed to hospital. My entire abdomen was full of liquid. I mean like all the way up here, all the way down. That's how bad this pain was at the doctor. Um, but I think that because I've gotten so used to dissociating, he was like, oh I don't think you're in that much pain because you didn't scream like my other patients. <sighs> Trying to leave the appointment, Brandon had to carry me to the car because I was in so, so much pain. When I say it felt like I was being ripped open from the inside, I genuinely mean it. And I think that you've been through this, you can also relate to it. Um, also, don't forget, my tailbone um, just freshly smashed, so I was not comfortable at all in any position. I was just bawling, shaking, like it was like I was going into shock. If they could please just do my tubal litigation like I've been asking for, then that would be wonderful. I don't have anything against my doctor because he's better than other doctors I've been to here, but it's also just like the fact that this is a thing where people don't actually get pain relief for is utterly barbaric to me and so many of you were sharing that this is like your regular experience like there were a couple of people who had a positive experience when it comes to getting an IUD um but most of them were um very traumatic honestly. Some of you went into shock, some of you completely fainted and passed out and then they were trying to shoo you out of the way because they wanted to get new patients into their waiting area. Inappropriate comments have been made about people and it turns out that others of you had defective Mirenas that the doctor didn't pay attention to as well so we're all in this together. Oh isn't it fun? There are some people who responded who deal with chronic pain or have been through trauma and so they got put under general anesthetic in order to actually get the IUD. Now I may be unpopular saying this but I think that that should be like the standard or okay at the very least to get local anesthetic or what is it there is um oh, what's it called is it freezing? So I googled that and it apparently makes the procedure hurt 70 to 80 percent less. Why aren't we doing this automatically? Why are we just expecting people with uteruses to put up with this unbearable amount of pain? And I'm sorry, it's not just a pinch. It is not just a pinch. And it turns out that some of you weren't even advised to maybe take some time off work or have someone even pick you up after the procedure because there is no way in hell that you're able to drive after that. Some of you did afterwards and I don't know how on earth you did it. 
Luckily, because I'm such a seasoned pro when it comes to the Myrena, I knew that I needed to actually book Brandon to have some time off work to be able to like ferry me around for this appointment. But yeah, that also played into the whole thing of like, you'll just push through it because you don't want to inconvenience people. Yet again, I think that this comes down to the social conditioning of us, like putting ourselves last, even though he doesn't care. Like he would honestly like just do whatever. He's like, anything you need, like whatever, I don't care. Um, but you still hold this because I definitely do because I've been to many, many medical appointments in my time and sometimes haven't been able to go through with like what they wanted to do. Um, so yeah, you do feel bad. So you don't want to put other people through that. I think a lot of that kind of sits with us. And can I also bring up slut shaming and virgin shaming here? Because this is absolutely a thing where people were being slut shamed if they wanted to have birth control um, and if they're like teenagers or something. I'm not about like legal age, like late teenagers, even though it honestly shouldn't matter. Um, I'm sorry, medical settings should be impartial and just here to like look after the people. And there's also the issue of so many people being prescribed to be put on the pill from a very young age as like a cure-all to all of their issues. And I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but there's actually a lot of health issues from the pill that people can get. Um, the pill isn't a cure-all for women. And honestly, if it was to, you know, like help with our emotions and stuff, I've just got to break it to you that men and teenage boys are also emotional. Just because they show it as anger doesn't mean that they're not emotional, but because we don't have that sort of um, method for, you know, helping men um, in the way that they try and help us, as in like just medicate us all the time, um, that's not really an option for them. But yeah, yet because, I don't know, we're maybe crying in pain or something, they're like, oh, okay, I don't want to deal with this, here, go on the pill, like, whatever. Ah, yes, it's me again, this is just my, what I'm gonna wear to the doctor outfit. <laughs> <laughs> don't come for me. Um, look, you've been coming here with a lot of these complaints, okay? I can just keep on up in the pills, up in the dosage, if that's what you want, if that's what you're angling for here. No, what I want from you today is for you to actually listen to me. I have been and also I'm the one that went to medical school and you do not even know what I dealt with when I went there. I want to be able to get to the root cause of the issue instead of just having like pills to mask the symptoms because I'm in pain right now. Um, you can't tell. You can't tell either, but I'm in quite a bit of pain. I've just become really good at masking it. That doesn't mean that my life isn't deeply affected by this all the time. Just because you're also a woman, that doesn't mean that we experience the same symptoms. Your medical training will have given you biases that you need to unlearn. You may not have even realized that you took these on. Now, you could actually be part of the positive change as opposed to perpetuating the same issues that people keep on dealing with. Like new research is coming out all the time. Doesn't it make sense to want to keep up with that? Let's talk about what people would like to have changed. Bringing it back to the study I raised at the very start of this video um, about the medical profession itself. So those medical students who dealt with sexism raised the things that they want changed right at the root of the issue, including teaching people not to be sexist, teaching how sexism presents itself in a medical sphere, having a clear reporting system in place which doesn't just focus back on the victims healing themselves, that actually like goes to the root issue, you know, like the perpetrators, the people that are doing the thing. I don't know, maybe actually doing training for everyone about what's acceptable and what's not. Whistleblowing was definitely an issue that was raised that it's not really safe for people to do that. And there was one other thing which got raised, which I've come across in every single workplace I've ever been at, which is a safe place for people to be able to actually talk about their issues. And um, as someone that's been an agony aunt to many a person in my working career, um, yeah, I there is definitely a need for this for people to be able to actually talk about like the things that they're facing and figure out like is this actually a problem is this normal because I think that we've become like we're so scared to speak up because we've seen what's happened to people time and again if they do speak up even after me too even after everything like if people speak up about the sexism that they're facing or harassment that they're dealing with your career can kind of just go whereas the perpetrator can keep going. Um, I've witnessed this, I've dealt with this, and it's not fun. Another thing that was raised in this qualitative study was the need for patriarchy to be abolished and of course I think that you know we're very pro that here for everybody's benefit. What quite a lot of you are actually raising was that you want to have women doctors and I just want to raise I don't believe it comes down to gender as to people being more empathetic or not honestly. 
because like I've pointed out here, so much of it comes down to systemic issues and from the education and training system itself, all the way to what the workplace perpetuates. And like, that's the thing that can really form stuff because women can think exactly the same way as misogynistic men. As I spoke about in my um, Gen X video, which I did get a lot of hate for, but I'm, I'm sorry, I've, I've dealt with it in workplaces, okay, and a lot of people have as well. Now, if you feel more comfortable having a female doctor, then that's absolutely fine, that's your prerogative. Like, the thing I'm pointing out here is that there's deep institutional issues that should be addressed as opposed to just boiling it down to a gender thing, because women doctors don't always treat people better. Okay. And whilst we're at it, can we please also address the racism and transphobia that is very present when it comes to medical training, because that is a key issue here too. Another thing which got raised by quite a few of you was removing religion from medical healthcare. And this is where I have to agree with you, um, you may not like me for this. Say for example you want an abortion and your doctor's religious beliefs don't allow that and therefore they stop you from getting that care. Or if you want to be able to transition but your doctor's beliefs are against that so your care cannot be got. Like, all sorts of issues can come into play. I was trying to think this through and I was like, okay, so would it be possible for people to train medically and then start their own practice um, within their own religious confines and have that to be a, like a specific thing? But then I was also like, but that means that parents would be taking their children to these places, which still keeps people within like this religious confine as opposed to be able to get like open, honest medical help. So say for example, there's child or teenager or whatever had been essayed. Say for example um, they had not been exposed to sex education properly and they were dealing with health issues but they couldn't bring this stuff up safely in this medical setting. I I just don't really see it working personally and for me I think that medical settings should be safe spaces for people to be able to get actual medical help. Um, and I don't believe that religion has any place in that. Um, if you don't agree with me, I, I would love to hear why you don't agree with me on that. But I, just for me personally, I don't really see it actually working in a way that is safe for patients. More demands from the people were around sedatives, getting pain relief, um, like just for things like getting a biopsy, maybe actually like being able to knock someone out for that, same as IUD, um, same as having a colonoscopy got raised, but I thought that colonoscopy is like, you did get knocked out for that, or at least local anaesthetic and pain relief or something. I, I, I guess it's different, varying on different countries, but I thought that's what you got here. Oh my god, I can't even imagine that pain otherwise. Ooh. I'll put this into context for you, okay? When someone gets a vasectomy, um, they get local anesthesia, but we don't get there for an IUD. Hmm, wonder why? People also raise that doctors need to keep learning, and when I was looking this up, because obviously I'm not in the medical field myself, so I don't know, but that's exactly what doctors have to keep doing. Um, what's it called? They have to continually professionally develop across their career. I couldn't find anything that states what must be learned as in terms of like continual learning. So for example, trans health, women's health, non-binary health, like they may not be comprehensively covered. Same as issues around the ethical treatment of patients and being aware about neurodivergent people's needs. Issues around consent, disability care, trauma-informed care, you know, I could go on. Now, people may say that you need to have all of that covered when it comes to, like, the initial training of doctors. Whilst I do agree with that, um, I also want to point out the fact that doctors became qualified in, what, the 1980s and stuff, and how far has medical knowledge come since then? So I would argue that there actually, there should be, in my opinion at least, key areas that doctors need to learn about as time goes on. I don't know, like, when it comes to medical boards or something, if they could say, everyone must learn this course this year, this thing, this thing, or whatever, um, to make sure that we're leveling everybody up at the same time. And some of you may be saying that that is too much for doctors to know, but I just want to reiterate that doctors are general practitioners, and they're here for the general population. And the general population is not just cis white men. <laughs> so 
there's there's more people to be considered here. Another thing which obviously needs to be addressed, as I talked about in my ableism video, is medical gaslighting, because this leads to people being put in very dangerous situations. Like, as what has been suffered by you, and I'll just share a few examples for you here. This ranged from tumours which grew to the point of when they were removed, another tumour had formed behind it, all the way to a large intestine having to be removed as gastrointestinal distress wasn't taken seriously by their doctor. And yet another person had broken bones, yet never been put in a cast, and they'd broken their spine twice for the doctor to say that they were overreacting, when the break had actually caused some nerve damage which nearly paralysed them. And if they hadn't sought out a specialist when they did, which they delayed because the doctor said that they were overreacting, they'd actually be paralysed by now. All of these scenarios are completely avoidable if doctors had just taken these people seriously. Another thing which kept on being raised was the fact that we know our own bodies and we know when there's something wrong, and this sums it up really well, I'll just quote you directly. You have years of experience and knowledge of medical issues, but I have years of experience and knowledge on living in my own body. If I feel something is wrong and you disagree, it's still worth investigating. At least to put your patient's mind to rest. I'll just say it now, like if you want to stop people from like googling their symptoms and stuff, maybe actually just take them seriously and like do some investigative tests and stuff. People would also love ways to actually be able to review doctors, and I don't know how this would practically work, but I know that on Google Maps, like, you can mark a company as being LGBTQIA plus friendly, like, there's a little rainbow symbol that you can get on it, but would that work for doctors? Like, I don't... I don't know if there is a way to review doctors, but that could be something that could be implemented, you know? And once again, the thing that people want changed is removing religion from politics and medical care. Um, I think that we all know about the terribleness that has happened from Roe v. Wade being overturned in the USA. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to state it again. Hard agree. Now we move on to the section of actionable things that we can do to make our lives a tiny bit better when we're trying to actually advocate for ourselves medically. There is such a thing as self-administered cervical smears. So you do this yourself, you know like how a COVID test works, um, but you do it on yourself obviously in the other area. Um, this is definitely an option. I think that they're rolling it out here in Aotearoa and I believe this is an option in other countries already. Um, you do still have to travel to the doctor's office but oh my gosh wouldn't it be amazing if you could have that stuff to be able to do at home but especially if you've dealt with like trauma or something this could be really really good for something that you could do so then you're still getting your health taken care of so do inquire about that another thing that i want to raise for everybody regardless of whether or not you go to the doctor often is education um i believe that sex ed is often terrible <laughs> in many cases <sighs> okay this is this is a bit more comfy um so what i'm gonna do is i will list some really useful websites for you down below along with some gynecologists on youtube so that you can go check check out their work. Again, I'm not a qualified person, okay? But I will send you to places and they'll all be listed down below and linked for you down below. This is one thing which I've been doing for most of my life and that is take a list with you, whether it's on your phone, whether you like to write it down, keep a diary of like everything that's been going on. Um, I've had to do this in order to be able to actually get medical treatment was keep a log of everything, um, keep a diary of everything. I even had like a chart on the wall where I would write everything out every single day, like every painful issue I was dealing with to try and like justify to the doctor like yeah I need help. So yeah don't think that you're overreacting when it comes to actually noting down your issues, it's really really important to do that. So then you also know for yourself and also because sometimes doctors are terrible about like taking notes for your medical records. So if you have that for yourself, that's very handy. People often suggested taking someone with you, preferably someone that is like quite imposing, whether it's a man or something, because hey, just like when you go to the mechanic, you take a guy with you, so then they're actually able to, uh, I don't know, pretend that they know what they're talking about, even if like you may be overqualified when it comes to your knowledge of cars. Um, but yeah, that's something that you could do, or if you don't have someone available, like, I don't know, is like a cut up Danny DeVito intimidating? <laughs> I'll also raise this again, politics matters. Politics affects all of our bodies, whether we want to believe it or not, politics is involved in everything. So be informed about what's happening in your local area. Be informed about what businesses are donating to what politicians. Um, be informed about like what politicians actually want to do when it comes to healthcare. And speak up when it comes to the fact that we need to have more funding for science because, again, like, 
women's health issues, trans health issues, non-binary health issues, like there are so many like understudied areas when it comes to people's health if you're not cis white male. Um, so this is like huge when it comes to speaking up for what we want and science absolutely does need more funding. I will definitely vouch for that. And I'm saying this at the same time as saying that doctors, nurses, everyone in the medical field, like teachers, we can lump in so many people here, need to get more funding from the government because obviously lots of this actually comes from government funding, which is exactly why I always point back to politics being so important to be actively aware of and involved in. Same as the barrier to entry to even become a doctor, nurse, medical professional, whatever. Like, that cost is so high, it means that most people can't even afford to be able to pursue that sort of career. And we want to have more people in this field, but how are you meant to do that if people can't afford to do it? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's the same as me pointing out here that appointments feel very rushed and too short. A lot of you are raising this, I've experienced this too. You feel like they're just trying to get to the next patient to the next patient. And if we had more funding, which meant that we could actually get more people trained in the medical field then that would actually mean that we'd be able to have longer time with our medical professionals that they'd be able to spend more time with patients therefore take them more seriously rather than accidentally brushing them off I'm trying to give people the benefit of the doubt here you know what I mean like there is so much full systemic change that needs to happen. We need more research and we need the politicians to be aware of where we want more research funding to be directed to. And also to the climate crisis, please, that would be great. And if uh, we could stop business from being involved in politics, that would also be even better. Also, make complaints if something happens. I know that it can be incredibly scary to have to do that, whether it's to the medical board or whoever. Like, if something has seriously gone wrong, like, from the experiences that some of you have shared, like, a lot of these should have genuinely gone to the medical board as, like, an investigation. Another thing I want all of you to be aware of is that we shouldn't be dealing with constant levels of pain or issues just because we've got a uterus. Like, that isn't normal, you shouldn't have to put up with it, it's just part of being a woman, or it's all down to your hormones, it's because you're anxious, it's because you're too fat, it's because you're too thin, like, all that sort of stuff. It's... <sighs> Just because you have a uterus doesn't mean that you're predisposed to deal with pain every day, forever. Like, it's important to note that irregular hymens are a thing, that if you have pain when you're trying to use a tampon, that's not normal, that shouldn't be happening. If you are having pain when it comes to consensual sex, that shouldn't be happening either. There are, there are so many things that are signs of legitimate health concerns, but because we've been told so many times to just brush it off as like being, that you're overreacting, like, that's not right that's not good so i just want to reiterate to you now like your pain is absolutely valid and it's not just part of existing okay as much as um we may believe it as much as i may have told myself that many times in my life that's not how it should be now if you made it all the way to the end of this very long video i've got no idea how long it will be it will be very very long um thank you so much and again massive 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 thank you to the 520 of you who participated in that survey i know that i couldn't go through every single person's individual experiences but i hope that i was able to capture things well that i was able to actually boil things down to a way that is digestible and understandable for everybody because um it's it was a lot to read through um, and I'm positive that you'll be feeling quite drained after this but if you did make it all the way to the end please leave what is it like we'll just do like this little emoji like the heart hands emoji because um, I don't know I just felt like it was appropriate and also a stethoscope emoji wow you've probably never used this before but now's your chance um, along with your comment, do you have any other tips that you could give people for when they're actually going for medical appointments, when they're going to try and advocate for themselves at the doctor? Um, because I think that we should be talking about these things. I think that we really do need to, like, get rid of the whole taboo around, like, women's health, trans health, like, of this shame around our bodies, because it's not helpful to anybody. Like, it really, it really truly isn't. It only means that we get left behind again and again and have to just suffer even more. And then we get told, like, oh, you're as strong as a man for being able to deal with this. It's like, no! Like, they don't deal with this. Like, if they have a vasectomy, they get local anaesthetic. We don't. <sighs> okay. Anyway, 
Thank you, lovelies, so, so much. Go watch something wonderful after this. Go outside for a nice walk. I know most of you are in summer right now. We're in winter, so it's definitely not like that for us. But I just hope that this was helpful in some way, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Resources are in the description. Um, education links are in the description. Um, and, yeah, I'll see you again in another couple of weeks. Bye. Thank you.